Lord Gus O'Donnell, welcome to In Conversation. Thank you. So, is the UK on the brink of chaos? No, I don't think so. I mean, Brexit has been an incredibly divisive issue for the country. You know, 52, 48 in the referendum. So, it, it's a difficult issue for the political establishment to sort out. How can they make everybody happy when there are two very conflicting views as to the nature of our future? Should we stay with Europe or not? So, our parliamentary system is finding this quite difficult because it happens to have coincided with a period where uh, the government does not have a majority in parliament, which is quite unusual in our system. Therefore, we're a bit stuck, but we're finding our way through. Well, a bit stuck may be an understatement. Hmm. It's been three years, and there doesn't still seem to be some kind of agreement with the EU. Why has it been so intractable? Well, I think it's, it's three years, as you rightly say. We've had three prime ministers, and I think we've had three rather large mistakes from each of them. So David Cameron, as prime minister, has admitted that he failed. He called this referendum thinking he'd be able to win it, and he failed to win it, and as a result, he resigned. So that was one prime minister, one failure. Second, Theresa May comes in, uh, inherits a majority government, but then calls an election that she didn't need to call and ends up with a minority government. She is unable, although she negotiates a deal, to get it accepted by Parliament. So, exit Prime Minister number two. Prime Minister number three, Boris Johnson, uh, comes in and with the no ifs, no buts, we will leave by October the 31st. But rather crazily, ends up suspending Parliament to stop them getting involved in the process as much and that turns into a catastrophic error that's, that's now been deemed unlawful by the Supreme Court and it had the political impact of uniting all the forces on the Remain side to come together and pass an act, so-called Ben Act, which stops us leaving with no deal. Let's clarify for viewers as well. I mean, it seems pretty certain, whatever the case is, that the UK is going to leave the EU. The only two options, though, are does it leave the EU with a deal, a divorce that is, so to say, semi-amicable, and it leaves the EU without a deal. In other words, it just bails out and nobody knows what goes on after that, but it means they're out of the EU. Are those really the only two options? It is not that simple. So, uh, the, the, the law that Parliament put through just in early September basically tells the Prime Minister, orders the Prime Minister to go to the European Council, try and get a deal. If he doesn't get a deal, then he has to ask for an extension. So we will then be moving forward probably to January and then carrying on negotiating. Um, but in January, let's say for example, if that some extraordinary thing happened and that it, uh, an agreement that parliamentarians and the British people can support does come through, then you will have an exit. It's just an exit with a deal. Yes, but, and there's an important but here, the Prime Minister, Boris Johnson, has said we will leave on October the 31st, no ifs or buts. Now, if... He'd rather be dead in a ditch, he says. Indeed. If uh, it turns out that he cannot do a deal, then all sorts of other options emerge. And many of those other options actually involve us not leaving, or at least not leaving in the same way. So, for example, if he is unable to do a deal, uh, he might decide to step down. He, uh, he will almost certainly face some kind of no-confidence motion, which might be passed by Parliament, which would lead us into a general election. If we go down the route of a general election, then the other parties have very different positions on Europe. So, for example, the Liberal Democrats have said that if they are a majority in Parliament, which, to be honest, is would be very unusual, uh, but if they were, they've said they will uh, just revoke Article 50, is the technical term, but what that means is it's as if this thing, as if the referendum never happened. So we would just carry on being in the EU. Now, Ignore the referendum, in other words. It's as if it didn't happen, exactly. Now, uh, if 
uh, and, and that's a quite unlikely scenario. But if there were a, a more plausible scenario where, let's say, Labour uh, is the largest party but is sharing in government in some way with the Liberal Democrats and the Scottish Nationalists in some kind of loose what we would call a supply and confidence deal, which is basically a sort of minority arrangement, issue by issue, not a full coalition. It won't be a full coalition. Then they have said that they will go down the route of another referendum where they'll put to the people, do you want to remain in the EU or do you want to take this specific deal that we have negotiated? And that will be a rather different deal to the deal that's on the table at the moment. What do you think of British voters, though, who say that you're cheating them of the actual outcome of the referendum, and that is to leave the EU? I think what we would say is, what, what did leave mean? And a lot of people were saying, well, leave, don't worry about leave, it's fine. We'll still be in the single market and the customs union, which turned out not to be true. So there were lots of things about that referendum, which I think were, were very misleading. Uh, and the question is, three years on, should we be very democratic and go back to the people and say, okay, well, you now know about the, the nature of this. We've spent three years arguing about it. You, you, you know, all of the issues have come up. So we're putting it back to you to say, okay. And so you're in favor of that, aren't you? Here's more, well, I would say, I would like there to be clarity. You know, I can imagine a world where the prime minister negotiates a deal and parliament votes for that deal then we'd be out and you know, we would get on with our lives. Personally, I, I have always backed the Remain side because I think it's damage limitation. That's what we're talking about. But if that's the will of the people and Parliament, absolutely, I would go with it and that's what we should get on with and make the best of it. So you're saying that it definitely has weakened Boris Johnson and has made the likelihood of a GE, a general election, more likely? What does the Supreme Court decision actually mean? In terms of the actual Brexit negotiations, not that much. In terms of a political cost to the Prime Minister, yes, huge. Uh, and I think it will have long-term implications as to the way our constitution works. And it will also, sorry, there will be one part of the Brexit negotiations. I think there would have been some Labour MPs who were thinking about voting for a deal that Boris Johnson might have got at the October 17th EU Council, who might now be saying, well, if that means that Boris Johnson stays as Prime Minister, I'm not so sure that I want to vote for it. So you're saying that it definitely has weakened Boris Johnson and has made the likelihood of a GE, a general election, more likely? Uh, yes, I think both of those things are, are true because it is very unusual for a Prime Minister to be found to have done something unlawful. Now, I don't think it, in a sense it makes any difference to the Brexit negotiations. The Supreme Court were very clear this is not an issue to do with Brexit. It was an issue to do with the way in which he chose to suspend Parliament for much longer than was actually necessary to achieve his stated objective of preparing for a Queen's speech. From a political point of view, do you think it's correct now that there seems to be greater force from judiciary as well to check an executive that they think may be going too far? This has been a trend that's been growing throughout my career in the civil service. So when I first started, the idea of what's called judicial review, JRing in, in the jargon, of decisions was, was quite remote. Over the years, that's happened more and more. And in a sense, what we're seeing now is the courts going one step further and looking at the actions of the government and using its prerogative powers to say, well, Yes, but these are defined in certain circumscribed ways and if you go outside those ways, actually we're going to decide that's unlawful and we will be the, we are the interpreters of law and that's our role in society. Time span. What kind of a realistic guess on when all of this, forgive me for saying this soap opera is going to end, 
when would you say things are going to become more settled? Right. Well, there are various no, scenarios. No, no I mean, end to this? One possibility is that Boris Johnson goes to Brussels, that EU Council actually manages to get some kind of a deal, brings it back, and somehow persuades Parliament, particularly those hardline Brexiteers that I said, that look, if you don't vote for this, then we might never leave Brexit, manages to get it through, in which case we would be leaving on October the 31st. I mean, technically there's lots of legislation that has to go through, so it's a little bit more complicated than that, but then we would be entering a two-year transition, and we would have left, ultimately, e even though we might choose to uh, uh, live by EU rules for quite some time. So that's one scenario. The other scenario... So just a couple of months, in other words? Just, yes. Um, yeah, exactly. By Christmas, you, yes. would, you would know, and there would, be a great, there would be more certainty for businesses. The other option is that we don't get a deal. There's an extension till January. During that period, there's possible elections, possible changes of government. Now, it may be the election results in uh, Boris Johnson and the Conservatives winning a clear majority, in which case they would have a mandate and they would, I hope, be explicit about what they would do and they will come back and they have a parliamentary majority to go with some kind of uh, deal or no deal and, and get us out uh, that way. Uh, or we have some other political arrangement, um, combination of Labour, Lib Dem, SNP, or in Lib Dem majority, which would various give clarity. Various kinds of coalitions or loose coalitions. Loose coalitions, yes. which yes. would probably go as, take us down the route of a second referendum. And what the Labour Party have said is they would take three months to negotiate uh, a deal. Uh, and that will be a deal that's a softer kind of Brexit than the one that the so-called Theresa May deal. So more on uh, uh, employment rights and things like that, and, and environmental issues. Uh, three months to get that deal, and then three months to have a referendum, which would be, do you want to remain or take this deal that they've operated on? So we're talking about, in all these various scenarios, um, mm. By June would, of next year? I would like to think by June of next year this will be resolved one way or the other. I think the British public are, to be quite honest, fed up with this. It's been going three years. Uh, there's all sorts of issues that the UK economy faces. Our productivity levels are low. We want to improve our public services. There are all sorts of issues which, to be honest, as a member of the House of Lords, I would love to be dealing with but everything's been dominated by Brexit. It's crowded out everything else. And on a more existential level, mm -hmm. is the UK ever going to be the same again? might say that this is the failure of democracy or is it the triumph of democracy well, that it ends up is, being this chaotic this is democracy at work because this is the problem with a with a referendum of the kind we had that it gave two options uh, one was remain and the other was leave but it wasn't at all clear what leave meant and various people voted for leave on the basis of different interpretations of leave let me bring up something that I think not everybody realizes, and that is other EU countries actually have had votes as well. Mm -hmm. They just didn't phrase it the way that the UK did in this extremely polarizing totally leave or totally be in, mm -hmm. the yes, no. They phrased it in other ways where it was about key treaties. Why is it that the UK did not go for a, a less harshly or polarizingly uh, framed referendum why make it so in or out because for those issues uh, countries like Ireland uh, and a number of countries have this rule that if there is a treaty change there has to be a referendum to go with it then the referendum is really about it doesn't even bring into question the issue of being a member of the EU that's accepted the question is 
do we want to accept this extension of the way the EU is going to operate, which is embodied within this treaty? And so in that sense, it's quite a marginal. And it's done in order to make sure that the people go along with the evolution of the EU. That was not why we had the referendum in the UK. The referendum in the UK was very much about a rather more long-standing issue about was our future as a member of the EU or not. And this had split the Conservative Party for a long, really? long time. To go back to what other EU countries have done, Denmark has a whole series of opt-outs, which actually refer to many of the things that the UK is unhappy about. They are not part of immigration. They have their own immigration and police. They don't have to allow the police to come into their area. They've been able to opt out of the euro as well. So why is it that that was not an option for the UK? So the UK has indeed specialized in opt-outs. I think we were the first ones at the Maastricht Treaty. We did the opt-out from the euro. Actually, ours was a far more concrete and definitive opt-out than Denmark got. Um, we had an opt-out from the social chapter, which was a lot of social rules, uh, which was later reversed by Tony Blair when he became Prime Minister. So we have gone down the, the question of opt-outs. Um, this was really more fundamental, and this was about um, do we really want to be part of an ever closer union, part of Europe going forward. So you think it was right that the referendum was so sharply phrased as a yes or no? Well, personally, no. I wouldn't have had a referendum at all. I think it's far too complex a question. I don't think it's the right thing for a referendum and I don't think the two options are as well specified. In this referendum, it wasn't clear what leave meant. So no, I would have said, and as you rightly said, when people came to vote on that, and you have to remember, David Cameron was there as Prime Minister, uh, head of the Conservative Party, the government of the day was supporting Remain, so were the Labour Party, so were the Liberal Democrats, so was big business, so were the trade unions, and it was basically the establishment versus the, the people, if you like, and the people's uh, slogan was take back control. And I think it wasn't about the, the, the details of UK-EU trade relationships and all the rest of it. I think what people voted on, although we'll never know for sure, and be very careful about people telling you that this is certain, I think this was a chance to say to the government, we're not happy. Uh, globalization, globalization and technology have created problems. You know, the financial crash back in 2008, at the time of the referendum in 2016, average wages had not got back even to where they were in 2008. So a lot of people were losing out. Although the country as a whole was gaining from globalization and technology, there were lots of winners but also lots of losers. And the EU was the... Well, the losers the were basically thinking, well, you know, it's migrants coming in and taking my jobs. But quite often, when you ask them, they'd say it's migrants from non-EU countries, mm -hmm. which was clearly an issue which had nothing to do with Europe. Our, our UK government could have, a, 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 you know, attacked that problem if it wanted to. Let me have you put your top civil servant hat Mm -hmm. back on mm -hmm. and ask you, is exiting the EU without a deal really so bad? There's been a leaked document uh, by other civil servants, not who you, you'd left by that time, mm -hmm. um, saying that actually it can be quite severe and that it could cause even public disorder mm -hmm. because there will be no fresh vegetables coming in uh, from the ports mm -hmm. that come in from Europe. So there may be a rise mm. in prices for mm -hmm. certain foods even. Uh, pharmaceuticals, drugs may not be able to be available. Do you agree? Because this is actually something that can be studied and Indeed. forecasted. Yes. So first of all, it is worth saying that Parliament has explicitly said the Prime Minister cannot leave with no deal. Um, so, you know, this is, uh, unless there's some kind of way that he finds to get around that law, then we won't be leaving with no deal. We'll be, uh, if he can't get a deal at the EU Council, then he has to ask for an extension. But to your point about what, what are the consequences of no deal, that leaked document, you'll be pleased to know the government has now published uh, that information. Yellow hammer, it's a 
Uh, it, it goes into all the details. Um, and of course, when you're looking at these things, it's important to plan for what might go wrong. So they are worrying about what kind of issues might happen at the borders. When you look at land borders, uh, like in, in Scandinavia, there's a sort of 20 to 30 minute average wait for lorries, um, which if it were replicated at Dover would be a serious problem. So things like fresh fruit, there are going to be difficulties. There will be difficulties down the route. Uh, for, so tomatoes so, are going to get uh, more expensive? Well, Yes, and you know there'll be some substitution and some things won't be in the shops quite as fresh. You know, these things uh, will happen but they'll be short term things. I think the issue for us long term is because you'll be leaving with no deal, there's no transition period. Uh, and that's going to be a real problem for our industry to adjust to it. So I think people don't realise the EU is our number one trading partner by a mile. That's the most important economic relationship for us. So there will be all sorts of very tricky issues if, uh, if we were to leave with no deal, which is why Parliament uh, acted to take that off the table. And on a more existential level, mm -hmm. is the UK ever mm -hmm. going to be the same again? There are different kinds of stability, aren't they? We have a stability based on a, a system whereby we are used to changes in control. So I have worked as head of the civil service for conservative prime ministers and labor prime ministers. I've worked within a government where the prime minister has changed from a Margaret Thatcher to a John Major in conservatives, from a Tony Blair to a Gordon Brown in labor. So we're used to those transitions and, and I think we're a strong democracy because we can manage that and we can manage that with an impartial civil service that carries on and works for all those sorts of things. Um, so I think that's quite a strong and stable platform. You said this in a very nice way. There is no going back, is there? No, I, th I think we're... To what the UK was... I think what a lot of us have learned is that referendums aren't a particularly good way of solving very, very complex issues where it's not clear what the two options people are voting for actually mean. Lord Gus, thank you very much for being on In Conversation. You're welcome. Thank you.